and uh, I think tonight's lecture is going to be uh, really a treat. Um, the, uh, f the idea of a, a graphic designer uh, lecturing at the school is uh, obvious and completely appropriate and uh, in a way a long-standing uh, tradition with SciArc uh, in terms of the intersection of uh, the possibilities of uh, graphic design as a form and model uh, of communications um, is at the very least something that's peripherally interesting to everyone I believe at this school if not much much more centrally uh, now. Um, Jan van Torn um, is uh, uh, an incredibly esteemed and acclaimed uh, graphic designer, uh, thinker, and professor uh, from the Netherlands. He was born in 1932, and he's just finished seven years uh, as the director of the program at the Van Eyck Academy in Maastricht in the south of, uh, of the Netherlands, and he's now returning back to uh, his, his, uh, his own practice, which he uh, suspended uh, to a certain extent uh, during this time. Um, and he's been a practitioner, however, since 1957 um, in, in Holland. I want to read a couple of very brief quotes from a, uh, a, an interview that simply set up, I think, a couple of the interesting issues about architecture and graphic design uh, in Holland uh, that I think everybody here will find uh, incredibly important. Um, perhaps many of you know that graphic design uh, professionally uh, in, in Holland is uh, a discipline which reaches uh, many, many people uh, primarily because of uh, sponsorship with uh, the post office, uh, airports, transportation systems, museums, uh, infrastructural and, and in bureaucratic systems. Uh, Jan quotes, what is fascinating about the situation in the Netherlands is that the architecture and design that came out of the modern movement were able to be integrated into Dutch society thanks to a long tradition of consensus. Um, in theory, uh, that idea is somehow uh, embedded perhaps in the idea of uh, uh, work very clearly, although it has not uh, constrained or ballasted the work in any way. It's probably given it many uh, other chances to succeed, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, let's say, in relation, then in relation to uh, this country. The intellectual tradition of consensus enabled artists as well as designers to work together with intellectuals who in turn acted as mediators with the government and the enlightened business world. So there was and, and has been and continues to be a relationship between uh, uh, the government and business world with a tremendous acceptance uh, of the vitality and knowledge of graphic uh, designers, both at the level of how it will explain the operations of the city or perhaps uh, give an image to, um, to a company. Uh, he goes further on to talk about a binary which we uh, as architects uh, often intersect with, and that is the engineer versus the artist. Um, after World War II, there are in principle two attitudes to be distinguished. On the one hand, there was the designer who adopted a rational attitude, opting for an objective transfer of values. This was the engineer. On the other hand, there was the artist who appealed to his or her own subjectivity and saw personal expression as the most important way to communicate. Both sides were driven together, however, because separately they could not respond to the social developments of the 1960s. This brought about mediatization, commercialization, and diversification of markets. And so the engineer and the artist uh, somehow joined together. And this idea of mediation is, a, is an incredibly uh, powerful uh, term, which I think describes uh, his work very strongly, which uh, he'll go into tonight, as well as the, the theories which uh, support us. Um, please welcome Jan van Torn. Good evening to you all. Um, this will be a rather theoretical talk. And tomorrow at uh, Cal Arts, I'll deal somewhat more with my uh, practical work. But before I start, I would like to uh, 
to thank uh, the committee of uh, SIAC students, Neil Denari and uh, Manji Reeve, for inviting me uh, to come here in the framework of the, uh, the spring 98 lectures. It's really a challenge and a pleasure to contribute to uh, the discussion in uh, your institute. And it's long ago that my wife and I were at the West Coast, and now uh, I may say more or less for the first time in my Davis uh, city of Quark, Quartz. Um, and I must say we really enjoy the open and uh, stimulating climate uh, of your place that we experienced already on Monday. Um, Neil Denari and, and, uh, and uh, Marjorie Reeve asked me to say something about my views as a, uh, a graphic uh, designer, a communication designer, and to do that against the background of the Dutch context, which has a very different cultural uh, pattern from that of the, the States. And Neil was already giving an indication of that. I hope that it helps you to understand not only my position, but also that it will serve as an introduction uh, to make it easier to situate the work and the mentality of the Dutch architects uh, that come uh, before and after me, this Dutch uh, invasion of, the, of this month. Uh, this means that I, what I said already, I will not go around showing you my own work today. There will be some slides of my own work included. I'll, I'll save uh, talking about uh, my own work for uh, Cal Arts tomorrow. The Netherlands have a, a cultural pattern with a long tradition of consensus. This boils down, boils down to the fact that for centuries we in the Netherlands have been living in a form of social organization that, with varying degrees of success, has tried to achieve a balance between the many private interests and the general interests. The particular and, in somewhat other context, the, the universal. You can't hear me? Is this better now? Okay. Um, yeah? Is, is the level of... Is, oh, is it okay now? Okay. Here we go. Um, so what I said, that we tried to achieve a balance between many private interests and the general interest. Between the private and the public. The government, in other words, the government bodies at national, provincial and local authority level and other public instances play an essential role in this. And could I have the first slide, please? As a result of the geographical situation, the most fundamental task of the Dutch government is to defend the country against the threat of flooding. The organization of that constant struggle against the waves of the North Sea and of several large major European rivers whose estuaries lie in the Dutch Delta, is thus a good example, I thought, to illustrate the character of that culture or policy of consensus. At the left, you see a, a kind of schem schematic uh, picture of how dangerous it is to live in Holland. What you see over there is that um, the darkest the dark part of Holland uh, at the right side of this enormous wave is that part that lies under the sea level. And since Roman times and in a more definitive form since the early Middle Ages, the Netherlands has public bodies that are responsible for the defense of the coast and river banks and for water management. And until the 19th century, this management was largely local. It was carried out in cooperation with the local population. And you should not take an oversimplistic view of this. Large regions of the Netherlands lie below main sea level, and parts of these sink about 20 centimeters a century. So, enormous areas of land and water have been brought under control in the course of the centuries 
by the construction of dikes, of dams, canals, locks, water mills, pump stations, etc. And an incredible number of lakes have been converted into fertile polders and systematically cultivated for agriculture, industry, housing, etc. Just like much of the land that has been reclaimed from the sea. What you see at the right is um, the introduction to a, a, a permanent exhibition uh, I designed for the, the Dutch Delta Works. And the Delta Works uh, are there. You see all these islands here. And the Dutch co coast, since uh, the end of the 80s, is closed there until there. This is open for the ha uh, connection to the harbor of Antwerp in Belgium. This is Belgium. This is the Netherlands. But has been closed. Another, th and we'll come to talk about that later, another important dam that closed off a former sea arm um, is the Eiselmeer. And that all because we had enormous floods starting, the most known in Holland are in this, started in 1014 until 1943. And these are the, the floods that are indicated here when there is a very high t spring tide uh, and then there's really a threat to uh, say surviving in the Netherlands. Okay, next slide please. Um, what you see here is the landscape. This is of north of Holland, north the province of North Holland, and this is the city of Amsterdam in the um, 15th century. And there you see the same situation, and Amsterdam must be, let's see. Oh, this slide is upside down. Could you turn it, please? Yeah. Um, city of Amsterdam is here. You see all this water. in that province and here already in the 15th century how all these lakes and waters have been brought to polders there was really a planning you still and this is still the case and next slide please um here is all also the no also the wrong this is the city of amsterdam could you turn it Yeah. And this is, this should be reversed. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in both cases, Amsterdam should be in the right corner. You see it over there. And <laughs> this is the 16th century, and there's still a lot of water left. The city is growing. And this is the 19th century. Um, of the beginning of this century and this is Amsterdam still and this is what is left from the water and that happened over the whole of Holland so this is an illustration of the enormous uh, efforts over the ages to bring this under control and to keep it dry um, and the next two please In this connection, a good example of the combination of administrative, economic, scientific, and artistic engagement is the development of the island of South Beveland in 1616 by the borough of Goes in Zeeland. Sorry? <laughs> Speak up. Okay. Um, the uh, Borsela polder that you, that you can see on the maquette over there, and that's somewhere here, it's just not on the slide, but it's in Zealand, connected with other polders. So, in 1616, the Bosla polder was uh, inundated, um, and in 1530, during the St. Felix flood, 
and it was only in 1616 that the municipality, the municipality of uh, Goes, as a new authority, obtained the right to build embankments on the remaining flat and marshes. And in according with Renaissance thinking, rectangular lots were laid out in the polder with a square planned village of Bosla in the center. And this is how Bosla looks today. And there you can see, uh, I'm sorry that I don't have a, a slide of the Bosla polder, but you can compare that with the layout of the other polders in the neighborhood. The village has a, a peculiar square street plan rotated through an angle of 45 degrees from the rectangular field plan of the polder using a local measure of 3.7 meters called the Schauser Rude and the village square was 89 by 140 meters a ratio in accordance with the golden section on which the division of the polder is based too. And I thought it was a good example to make clear how the city governments, local governments, uh, but also investors in the cities um, were cooperating with engineers, intellectuals, artists for, the, um, for reclaiming this land from the sea in the way, say, culture, commerce, uh, administration cooperated together, had to. Next two, please. The two largest projects in this century are what I told you already, are the Eiselmeer polders in the north of Holland and the Delta plan. And this is, what you see at the right, is a, a model um, we designed as a group of designers for this museum I showed you earlier in the slide on. Um, a model of this Delta plan. And it's situated in, um, in the building of Wim Quist, the service building of the, the largest dam in the whole plan that you see here. This is that, the largest, this is an open dam to um, let sea go in and out and only closes uh, when it's really necessary because of the high floods. Um, and that is um, especially because that we want to keep the, um, the environment as it is. And it's rather successful. After long discussions in Holland, this were already, they started to block off all the sea arms by permanent dams. And then, because of the enormous uh, richness of nature in this sea arm, there was an open dam. And it's the first time that we have uh, an open dam in the long history of blocking, say, the country of the sea. And what you see there is through the windows of the building. So watching the, um, the, the model here, you see the dam over there. Oh, it's in the same direction as the reels. Um, what I said, the two largest projects uh, of this century were the Delta Plan and the Asamir Polders. They were both carried out under the ultimate responsibility of the Minister of Public Works. The preparation, the technical execution, were in hands of the State Public Works Department and the specially instituted divisions of Delta Plan and Eiselmeer Polders. And these public bodies have considerable executive and administrative powers. They collaborate with many scientific institutions with guided technological, environmental, and social research and development. And among their responsibilities is landscape development, land use, distribution, and also the preparation of social infrastructure, the planning of cities, villages, etc. It's a very, um, it's a non-democratic administrative body. It's controlled by the parliament, but um, it's, it stems from this long tradition of an administrational public body that takes care of our dry feet. Um, uh, 
perhaps interesting for you to see is that um, when the, this, the yellow parts are the existing dunes on sandbanks in the, in the North Sea. These are important cities. Uh, but these are all built dikes. And, all the, and only at low tide, this, in, in earlier times, around 1,000, there were um, dry places. But over the ages, so that the people over there succeeded to take all this land from the sea and to keep it dry. We got the next two, please. This is the right is upside down again. Yeah. This gives you an impression of the model. Uh, it was very interesting to work on this model. That, um, was um, filled with water, and so we could um, uh, um, present to the, to the public what, say, the water movement in principle is. It's not only the water that's coming from the sea, it's also a lot of water coming from the rivers, from the rest of Europe. And um, so here we could uh, really uh, Organize spring tide, low tide, um, and flood waters, etc. When you go there, you can see that it was a project. Only this model that is seven meters in width is. Uh, we worked on that for five years in uh, cooperation with uh, with engineers responsible for working out, say, the water household in an, in a gigantic uh, model that is uh, as large as seven football fields. And it was a model that the, um, the laboratory for the water household in Holland was uh, working out all details. OK, next, please. The Eiselmeer plan. Um, you see here a map at the left of the, already in the 19th century, people were planning to um, keep the sea out of this enormous sea arm um, in the north of Holland. And this is Amsterdam again. You see, everything is, has become dry in that province. There is here the, um, they, they made a canal to the, through the dunes to the sea. Uh, all former ages, ships to the harbor of Amsterdam came this way, down to Amsterdam, which was very complicated. So in the 19th century, they, they had this canal as a direct connection. Um, this was, over the ages, an enormous threat, you can imagine, to the lower uh, parts of Holland. So people would think about building a dike and then reclaim land with polders uh, from that former sea iron. What happened this, in this century, and this is the map of uh, what happened in the, it started in the end of the, at the end of the 20s and ended, uh, I think about, I'll say it later to you, about in the 80s. And this is building the dike over there, building a polder here, building a polder here, and this is a combination of two polders. And they are also building a dam here, but that's more for traffic a direct connection between the polders and the mainland. Uh, you can imagine what an enormous work that is. As, uh, what I consider as something is really wonderful. You should really should come and travel in this land that is as flat as the sea is and what is completely organized by this enormous administrative body. The next two, please. And I have some slides of the landscapes. The completely planned landscape of the Isle of Polis. The uh, Wieringen Meerpol is about 20,000 hectares. The northeastern polar, 48,000 hectares. And these two are carried out between 1926 and 1940. And the eastern and southern 
um, polders, approximately 100,000 hectares together, are commenced in 1950 and completed in 1970. The next two, I brought some um, aerial views to show you the, the plant character of the um, of these polders, how the uh, the farms are situated. Mm -hmm. When it works, yeah, that's right. Um, there is um, an arrow on the um, on the picture on the left, so that you can see in which direction the photographer was looking. And the next two. Perhaps interesting for you to know is that the, um, the, the group of people around Aldo van Eyck, Rietveld, uh, so the, the modernist, um, that came out of the Second World War, were very much involved with the city planning in um, and the development of a model of cities in the new polders. And there is one city, the city of Nagele, that is uh, very well documented and is a, is a very fine example of. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm not doing it again. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> No, I, I was trying to say that, uh, that this is a very good example of how Dutch architects, designers, and other intellectuals cooperate in setting, sociologists, setting up in communities in the new poses. In the time available to me, I can unfortunately only refer to a few classics of the Dutch tradition of consensus. They are intended as illustrations of a cultural climate in which everyone strives to achieve a pragmatic agreement, like I said, balancing private and public interest. In almost every case, a widely supported solution is found in the political and administrative terms. For instance, we have a system of education that is the result of a gentleman's agreement between the denominational parties and the socialists at the beginning of this century, which brought universal suffrage for men and women in exchange for a system in which every religion has the right to its own schools. In principle, we believe that the state has only a limited role to play in the organization of daily life, though it has an important role in the system of checks and balances with respect to lower levels of authority, social organization, or groups, and private institutions. And this culture is based on a firm belief in the strength of social organization on the one hand, and with the government on the other, as a safeguard for public interest and democracy. This enlightened view of the task of the government is connected with a Protestant tradition that deploys scientific insights and methods to deal with every possible social issue. You can thus also state that the social quality of that society owes a great deal to the interaction between intellectual pragmatism and the enlightened private interest of professional groups, trade, industry, and authorities. And the systematic involvement of intellectuals entailed by pragmatic modernity has led to a long tradition of disciplinary care, a form of care by which the ideas resulting from intellectual work are brought into action in cooperation with the organized interests of the state, business, and others but at the same time serve the public interest. Apart from the way in which water management has been organized throughout the ages, examples can be found in many different spheres. Some of the best known 
uh, are the government organized care for the homeless and the unemployed in Amsterdam at the end of the 16th century. Uh, these people had to be educated to learn how to behave like citizens. And another example is the invention of life insurance in the 17th century by an architect, fortification architect and national scientist, Simon Stevin. And the implementation of urban development projects, of course, in the first half of this century in Amsterdam, the large scale social housing program, programs that Bel Lager and Van Eester worked on some, for such a long time. Please, the next. These are the, uh, the drawings of Bel Lager for the plan of the southern, new southern extension of Amsterdam at the beginning of this century that has been built and realized and is still a great place to live. It's a pity we just moved to Amsterdam. My wife couldn't find a place in that area because too many people want to live there. But. And of course, Van Eystra, who planned the, uh, the big extensions of the city to the west. And all the architects of the, uh, the functionalist uh, movement, or how to say it, the, uh, that's called functionalist, uh, who were involved in, um, in the organization of that. People like Belag and Vanessa drew on historical examples and the ideas of that part of the avant-garde at the beginning of the century that assigned intellectuals, artists, architects, designers a mediatory function with regard to the social culture conditions of capitalist society. And that is a social engagement that boils down to the deployment of ideas developed by the Enlightenment for the societal reconstruction of industrial production, consumption and distribution. Next please. And my last example is the Dutch PDT. This is an annual report that I did in 72. Dutch PDT is a unique example because it formulated an aesthetic policy as early after the First World War. A policy which convincingly placed itself in the service of public interest, basing their ideas on moral, cultural socialism and the perspectives of the Bauhaus and new objectivity, intellectuals, architects, artists, created a policy which attempted to reconcile the more or less radical way of thinking of the avant-garde with the corporate interests of the PTT as a state-controlled company. And within the company, they found a willing ear among managers and intellectuals who responded to the appeal to their affinity with utopian expectations concerning the makeable society rooted in reformation and modernity. And it's perhaps interesting to know that from the beginning of PDT, the end of the last century, until the privatization of PDT uh, in the 80s, there always have been Christian democratic directors, the board of directors were always Christian democratic, so it's, this reformation is also important, but in cooperation with modern architects and art historians and many other professionals. Please, the next two. It's interesting to know that what, I, what you saw is not the annual report for the, the business part, but that the, the Dutch um, PTT as a state company also had, until its privatization, a social report. So in the way, that's what you saw some pictures of. So it is in this pragmatic cultural context that the familiarity of Dutch intellectuals with the emancipatory movements of the 19th and 20th century and the thought of the historical avant-garde at the beginning of this century, 
could function in the Netherlands, perhaps more than anywhere else, and the results of that can be traced in almost all areas of daily life. Systems of social welfare, health care, social housing, old people pensions, etc. And against the back, this background of the idealistic Christian and humanistic worldview, this attitude of practical intellectuals, scientists, architects, journalists, film television makers, should be understood as a continuous attempt to deal imaginatively with the conflict of tradition and innovation of culture. After all, their position amid the opposite, opposing private interests, and at the same time their dependence on them, calls for strategies for the formulation of mediating concepts which make action for the benefit of the common interest possible. This, however, applied only to a certain extent. It not only, it not only includes that the ideas of intellectual mediation determine cultural re reality to a significant extent. It also means that the values and norms arising from the production relations are passed on to the population. It introduces a material and a mental pattern on the basis of concepts and practices developed in that cooperation between practical intellectuals and their clients. Therefore, I think it's characteristic for the development during the 20s and the 30s that the private and public interest were thought and represented by intellectuals to be in harmony with each other. The production relations of industrial capitalism and the division of labor, the subdivision into specialisms, were thus tactically accepted by intellectual agents. And as a result, we can see in hindsight, in the end of the studies, the expression of the social engagement came under pressure and was more and more confined to so-called objective approaches to the organization of production and more and more to formal aesthetics. As a result of the ongoing process of modernization of the Cold War, after the Second World War, a, a further restriction, oh, sorry, as a result of the ongoing process of the modernization and the Cold War after the Second World War, a further restriction arose in the 50s. A static concept of reality developed internationally, which combined faith in the neutrality of means with a disciplinary practice of a highly normative nature. And since then, our living environment, in a natural and cultural sense, has been further instrumentalized by a wide variety of institutional and commercial interests. We have become dependent on an increasing denseness of communication networks, the static, strategic aims of which remain obscure. And at the same time, the old utopian ideas for the improvement of social circumstances are undergoing a deep crisis. We, as professional mediators, have unfortunately proved to be unable to stay out of the ongoing process of colonization of culture, mediatization of culture, by economy and bureaucracy, and find ourselves nowadays incapable of reformulating a new relationship to the public sake. And as a result, um, our dealings with reality consist of no more nowadays than a myriad of individual sidetracks reduced to mere form, together with conventional programs and the production of stereotypical meaning. I think that because intellectuals, designers, architects, fail to reflect critically on the conditions under which their own action comes about, their mediating role in society has been lost. Problems of public nature are more and more veiled by a pluriform spectacle of form. And the common interest increasingly is formulated by marketing and the languages of communication 
has been replaced by the forms of expression of advertising and public relations. Exemplary and inspiring projects have been realized in the Netherlands in this century, leading to the welfare state. But enormous problems have arisen as well. And it's not that those problems had not been pointed out before. But in the meantime, we have arrived at a situation in which critical intellectual mediation finds it difficult, also in Holland, to find compatriots for social engagement. Under the pressure of the changing circumstances, the tradition of consensus has been eroded. Many intellectuals have abandoned the hope of change and have safely retreated to the autonomy of the professional world. And the pessimism of the intellect appears to have flipped into an optimism of action. It is the acceptance of the normality of everyday life finding it more comfortable to forget its ideological and therefore political dimension. It's painful to, to, to say that there is not so much left of the system of sticks and balances between the private and public interest in the Netherlands. What is socially seen as the favorable effect of the tradition of consensus is systematically eroded by deregulation the deregulation of a radical capitalist economy. Nevertheless, it has left behind this policy of consensus, a cultural infrastructure and a refined level of services which with, with which the neolib, neoliberalism builds now its conservative revolution. The regulatory task of politics and government, although throughout history it has never been, of course, free of abuse in the service of the dominant social forces, has been seriously undermined during the last 20 years by the privatization of many government tasks. And it's not for nothing that political debate in the Netherlands is as dead as a doornail. Fundamental issues are no longer discussed. Politicians have adjusted too. Politics has become a private instead of a public instrument. And they make use of divisionary tricks to avoid showing their hand. And as a, a good example is that since the 60s, for two cabinets, both the only two progressive coalition governments in Holland, have fallen because of the impassioned discussion of an insignificant case in the parliament. The actual reason was that both governments had emphatically stated their intention of taking measures to put aside a substantial part of the yield from landed property and natural deposits such as all for the common good. The so-called liberalization of world economy, increasingly propagated by the international chambers of commerce, thus by the global operations of the oligarchies of multinational bureaucracies and politics, is at the expense of the freedom of governments with regard to policies concerning the natural environment and social conditions. Perhaps even more serious is the fact that in the information economy, the public debate on our joint interests in the media disappears behind the cheery dream world of the market. And that is also because practical intellectuals like us identify ourselves too easily, I think, with a paradigm shift that seems to offer these exciting and fascinating opportunities. And according to uh, my son, who is an architect and uh, theorist at the Bellag Institute, visiting here in April, he, he said that the answer to this is not to be found in the banal world of the supermodern, but lies concealed in the 
in a history and a future which, with modern knowledge and understanding, must overthrow the preoccupations of our times and provide an alternative for them. Naturally, we all make ourselves guilty and or take pleasure in the advantages of media addiction, in the ecstasy of self-destruction and the complete absence of boundaries. But we have lost sight of the fact that textuality, ambiguity, and undefinedness often side with dominant ideological forces. And that is why the subversive pleasure that hides within hypermodernism can only be an alternative if it also develops an agenda that goes beyond the banality of the normal and relates to that of social currents." End of quote. And this brings me to the second part of my talk and, uh, and to my own uh, discipline, communication design and the possibilities I see for a, a recuperation of its uh, public and therefore democratic significance. Uh, what you see here are not the real tulps, but these are wooden tulps that you also can buy in the flower markets in Holland. And I thought there's a kind of virtuality that I liked very much. The, the next two, please. At the left is uh, a statement of Louisa Senthouse of Kellogg's. And she was a, a student in the postgraduate program in Maastricht, where I've been for seven years. And the right is a, a statement of John Tekra, the director of the Dutch Design Institute. I give you some time to read. <laughs> Okay. Prior to the period which John Tecker calls the new modern age, communication design has become an essential factor in the production, distribution and consumption of commodities and services. As a result of adapting to the in intensification and transnationalization of market and media, it speaks the one-dimensional language of mass communication, a global idiom that it has itself helped to generalize and limit and the influence of the commissioning situation, and in which the constructive social orientation of early, earlier modernity has been lost. It is thus, in my opinion, questionable whether the present organizational, substantial, and expressive practice of the design discipline is able to respond to the Save Our Souls, which is increasingly raised by the ecological crisis of the natural and cultural environment. The next two, please. Like all other forms of professional mediation, design owes its success to the economic and technical scientific development promoted by industry, services, and government. This is very clearly connected with its share in the planning of production, but even more with the production of images and visual stimuli in the media, which is essential to the retail of products, information, and entertainment. Communication design thereby coordinates an important part of the virtual integration of the consumer in the social regulatory mechanisms of the market services and again politics. Information and knowledge have become commodities in the capitalist media society. Through growing commercialization and consolidation, monopolies in the communication and cultural industry have created a global public sphere which does not offer any scope for discussion of the social and cultural consequences of what is called the free flow of information a notion that stems from the United States, I thought, already in the 
twenties. So they don't offer any scope for the discussion of the social and cultural consequences of that free flow of information that they have organized, let alone of democratic control of their activities. And like Kohlhaas, Rem Kohlhaas was saying, consequently we live in a world in which the reality of the socio-economic condition is camouflaged by the decorative glorification of the inevitable. The next two, please. Life in the information society is an unending present of institutionalized pluriformity. It is a one-dimensional fiction without references to our daily life and the reality of direct experience in our social historical uh, context. Many fields are left out of consideration because they raise awkward questions for the status quo, which is why they fall outside the frame of reference of intellectual mediation. And again, Rem Kohlhaas, but also uh, Paris Clavel, a designer from Paris. Both have noted that this led to an amorphous periphery, to a decline in areas where no linger, which no longer receive any attention because they have passed out of the field of vision. And also, I must say, communication design, too, is pretty short-sighted in this respect. The next. The pragmatic routine of designers lends in the practice of the information economy to a legitimation of the existing social system, which they now regard mostly as a natural condition of their work. The result is that the ideas of many designers about the communicative meaning of the discipline reduces the scope of their activity of and their scope of their activities to an institutional legibility of the world. And that is a form of self censorship in which the limitation to organizational, technological and aesthetic aspects yields the use of language which turns the media into this spectacular non-places we are so addicted to. Next. Nowadays it's common for designers to justify their mediation in a combination of mentalities from the two camps of modern practice. And Neil was already uh, reading a quote of mine saying that. The, the, they see um, their action, their mediation, as a fusion of engineer and architect. And their activity is just, uh, uh, justifying their activity with an appeal on the pragmatic attitude of the engineer, the neutral intervention linked to universal values, and to the intuitive approach of the artist. In other words, to his subjective experience and interpretation. And in my opinion, this notion of communication, of mediation, is not very realistic as long as it fails to relate the conflicting interests of, of the social relations of client and, pub, uh, and public in a critical manner to the way in which our messages, our products are handled. Next, please. I hope you, I hope you recognize Mr. Berlusconi, former Prime Minister of Italy and also in charge of one of the major communication networks in Europe. I don't want to paint you only a kind of a very pessimistic view, but try to be, try to analyze the situation in such a way that there is, say, an alternative way of action possible. I believe that at the same time, 
there is a serious demand in design for a constructive program of more or less institutional forms connected with an emancipatory reconstruction of society. This demand fits in what fits in with what Edward Said has described as the revolution which has taken place in the consciousness of women, minorities and, and marginal groups, which is so powerful that it has influenced mainstream thinking practically all over the world. Many designers and theoreticians seek the answer to this uneasiness in linking the aesthetic to the social element in a new leadership role for the discipline. In my eyes, that does not seem to be a very fruitful mission. I think that designers, architects also, I guess, will have to put more imagination in understanding their interaction as a social phenomenon if they, were, if they are to deploy their practical creativity for the formation of independent opinion and public debate. Next. And in that case, we are talking about designers who are prepared, I think, to share fate, to have a mentality that replaces the politics of cultural differentiation by a politics of sociality, like Scott Less, a sociologist from Birmingham, was pointing out. It's only by openly opting for the collective interest in dialogue with the private, private interest, in our case with the private interest of the client, that intellectual agents like designers can contribute to a genuine democratization of the public sphere, revealing that the subjective interpretation of the message is an absolute condition for the transformation of visual language into what Umberto Eco called a stimulus for critical reflection instead of leaving it as an invitation for hypnosis. A practice of design that abolishes the discrepancy between fact and fiction in the transfer of information produces gloss and glamour. If the recipients are to become masters of their own experience again, it is necessary for the mediation to surmount the old polarities of, modern, of modernity in practice and to escape from the postmodern aesthetic of repetition in ever new settings. And that is why attempts to analyze the actual situation outside the established picture of the world are of essential importance for designers to arrive at in a more realistic uh, social cultural perspective as a basis for their mediation, for their communicative action. Next. I think that an effective operational critique is based on heretical insight into the cultural condition and a related idealistic perspective. They both should serve as guidelines for a strategy which, which tries to establish a dialogue with the audience. And I'd like to call that a multidimensional ecology of mind that expresses itself in the approach to the commission. Because it, in concept and form, breaks through the illusion and the control of convention. And in that case, design need no longer to be reduced to a primarily concept of pure aesthetic activity, rather, it is a method which attempts to make the analytic process coincide with the empirical process based on the inspiring interaction between the pragmatic experience of making and the reflection of thinking. Next.
The idiom of global language in the media restricts scope and richness of the languages of which we are all part. The languages which map the world in a different way, or the languages with a limited circulation to which we also belong, hardly come into consideration, if at all. The many-sidedness of human experience is seriously threatened by this common denominator of mass communication. And that is, I think, why designers who are concerned by the corporate takeover of public expression must first allow themselves sufficient room to maneuver for a dissident attitude vis-à-vis -vis the normative determination of mass media culture. Next. A visual journalism like communication design, which assumes responsibility for the forming of opinion and participation in the public sphere, must also invest in expanding insight and experience of the representational and signifying an expressive function of the visual languages. And in doing so, it should arm itself not only with the social perspective, but also with the means of expression for innovative interpretations and additions to, to the conventional codes of information. Both are fundamental, are a fundamental condition for a commentary embedded in our products, for a narrative polyphony aimed at the dialogical relationship with the recipients. Next. This is the charter of graphic design published in Italy during a conference where many European and also American designers, well-known persons, tried to articulate how important it is to have a good professional education. So, again, I give you some time to read it. And this is a part of the, the charter that deals with um, vocational training, so the, the training of designers in Italy. And I would say that it's not only high time to implement these proposals for a new curriculum for design education in it Italy, but also in other countries, and mostly in my country. The orientation and content of the courses are often hopelessly out of date. In the first place, I think a radical change is required in the analytic range of instruments of teachers and students to enable them to view the information economy with its pretensions of free news collection and the independent formation of opinion in a more critical and realistic manner. What is at stake is not, I always want to make clear, to blame the existing educational or professional practice, but we have, I think, to redefine the role of the profession and with an appeal to a sense of reality. It's so important, and trained critical thought is so essential for the renewal of programs, methods, and tactics of visual communication. At the same time, we should realize that theory is not practice, and that work will never be, or should never be, an illustration of thought. And therefore, it's very important, I think, that a, a pluriformed topography of the world begins in our professions with the acceptance of a complementary sensory use of language. Training courses must therefore complement the rational tradition of communication design with the equally important, effective, non-literary means of expression of the text 
image, sound, space, movement, and so on. Furthermore, it is at least as important for designers to become familiar again with the strategies of the reflexive tradition because of its di disruptive effects on the established myths and conventions. It would enable us an essayistic and stylistic intervention which reveals the message as an argument and opts with that for active interpretation by the recipient. The next, please. Um, at the left, right page, there is a statement by Alan Lupton, oh, sorry, by Lorraine White, and at the right, by Alan Lupton, about the role of professional training. Professional training, which failed to pay attention to social context and cultural signification, soon collapses substance into design. Academia are the places par excellence where alternatives to the restrictions of the market can be developed and tried out. Lorraine Wilde and Alan Lupton described here how important this is. And it's precisely at this point in time that the language of critique must be combined with the language of very concrete possibilities in terms of both content and expression. And this strengths and dissidents positions towards the loyalty demanded by the constant industry and towards the norms and rules of the disciplinary field. And at the same time, we have to equip students and ourselves as teachers in their resistance to the orthodoxy of the institutional power concentrations. Next two, please. The images I show you before are part of a publication an announcement of a symposium that I designed, the booklet I designed and organized the symposium. So now you have an idea where they come from and how they are used in the, in the brochure. With the decline of humanist ideals and utopian expectation, we as specialists find ourselves confronted with a fundamental discomfort about the relationship between individual professional action and the collective interest. I therefore think that the debate concerning the social cultural role of our disciplines should be reopened. Form and function must no longer be defined as separate commercial, aesthetic, linguistic, or utilitarian areas, but was once more related to their real social significance. And in this respect, you may interpret what I just said as a plea for recuperating the practical and theoretical traditions with constructive forms of action and thought. It's a plea which takes the inevitable contradiction between the interest of all participants in the production as its point of departure, including our own intentions and social expectations and articulate that in concepts and forms which serve the public debate on the improvement of social life. The last two slides, please. To end with the richest man on earth. That's why I went to the Jan van Eyck Academy seven years ago, because there was really as a historical opportunity, again, an opportunity, perhaps one of these rare moments nowadays in Holland, that you can make use of the consensus tradition of consensus policy when you find an understanding person in the administration or a group of persons who understand 
what this thing I was talking about have to deal with. So that new program of the Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht, where I have been director from 91 till the end of last year, proves the still existing possibilities in the Netherlands for the creation of places for independent practical research. This postgraduate workplace, as we call it, working place, workplace, is meant to be for art and design, where the laboratory is for science. As a, as a center for visual culture, the academy is not meant to be a school where specific methods are taught, but a research institute where many methods can be and are elaborated and tested against the practice of cultural production based on the principle that the functions of critique must be maintained. And the academy is intended as a place for active exchange between professionals and others whose dealings with cultures are not confined to conventional values but who want to operationalize critical thought and action in the face of the instrumentalization of visual culture by institutions and media I was talking about. This is how we hope, even in this, say, conservative time, to contribute to the revitalization of the modern, John Tekra was talking about, so argumentative and non-consumptive forms of visual communication. In other words, to the renewal of art, design and theory as truly public practices. Thank you very much. They, they are always in conflict with one another, I would say. What, but what, um, say, during my career, being educated after the Second World War, there still consisted the climate, like in the Dutch PDT, but also in the railways, in, in, in governments, in museums. Um, there were other intellectuals, and also in, in business, uh, people who shared, um, say, a common interest. Perhaps not always different, with different particular interests, and, co and so it's always conflicting. But it still existed this idea that there was something as a common sake, huh? out of a social democratic or a Christian or humanistic or whatever background. And um, so you, there was always the possibility to create a space or extend the commission in such a way that it had a more dimensional uh, character. And that is something that has been lost nearly completely. I was very lucky to have this guy in the ministry, Lorraine knows how that worked a little bit, but, and they're still possible, but it has changed, in, that's, that's come to in a complete different situation. And that makes that, I didn't say that, but design is so flourishing in the Netherlands because we have this enormous amount of money still available, but also the, 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 the cultural infrastructure, the people in the public bodies uh, who are familiar with the system. The problem is that they are not familiar with, say, the long tradition and, and the political aspects that you never talked about, but were rather clear in the way you found solutions.
I would say that, that was the first idea. I did it because I had a need, as a, as a practicing professional, to um, to really try to open up new spaces in the commissions, because of all the privatizations uh, and the, the whole development into this information economy, this paradigm shift in culture. It was very difficult to to say to articulate a critical views and to create officially um, say, uh, public spheres where these kind of things and ideas could be discussed. That, and, also, and, and of course, not, uh, say, produced. So that was the idea behind um, the Young Van Eyck Academy's program, to create a, a free haven, to find people together, not only from the Netherlands, but in an international context that had the same kind of need to produce on the basis of critical insight and to come to a kind of exchange and see how they would work out in uh, making things. And one of the first things we found out that say, the, the idea of say, the, the social engagement that was uh, for the occasion named, say, that there was art, design and theory that we would really, all three re not only have our base in a professional domain, but that we have a, a relationship to, 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 to the social context, to the social cultural context, which is a political notion, of course. That in the moment we started to discuss that, it became extremely difficult for the three uh, departments to make that intention uh, work. And we struggled over the seven years, Lorraine, I think, huh? by trying to do that again and again. But the, the first symposium that we organized had the title Justice for All. And there was an enormous battle between the three departments. Um, everybody, for a kind of psychological reason, I think, fell back on the conditions of their own domain. And there were a very serious talk about the split between the three departments in the academy. But after some months of discussion, we came back to our common agenda. Um, however difficult, a split of several ages you can't bridge in, um, in, in a short time. The idea was much more that you create a kind of a dynamic situation where the professions all the time relate to the social-cultural context and discuss its political consequences, its, its aesthetical, aesthetic consequences, etc. And in a way, I think we in spite of all the dreams, they were perhaps much larger, and we succeeded to keep that going. And we never had the idea to be a new Bauhaus or whatever, but to be that place where very openly things could be articulated, and not, on, not only in thought, but also in the, in the things we make. And so it's an ongoing project uh, that uh, came into life because of the need of a number of people to have this open space in culture. And this culture is always pretending to have uh, these spaces for alternative, but we are losing them very fast, I think. Thank you.